I would like to thank all of you for giving me this incredible opportunity and I'm absolutely humbled and totally honored to be here to share my thoughts and my life's engagement with all of you. It has been a personal journey but a lot of truths have emerged and I thank you for giving me this time and space to talk about it. Um, my talk is entitled Behind the Veil because I feel a lot of uh, a lot of tortures and a lot of hidden, concealed um, lives that animals lead in captivity, especially in captive conditions, is not known to the world. And it took us many years of understanding how we could make a little difference. Uh, even a small difference is a huge difference in their lives. And if, at, at the beginning, it was uh, very unclear how we would go, what we would do. And in, in the time that I was growing up, in the 70s and 80s, animal activism, animal uh, welfare, veganism, this was, these were words that were not even understood, not properly comprehended. There was hardly any um, uh, consciousness around animal welfare issues or animal uh, uh, work uh, and the, and, uh, the movements that were happening or were about to start almost started at the time we, we just entered it. It was an innocent, active engagement with relieving the suffering and pain of animals. And little did we know that in the 20 years or in about three decades, the movement has become that much more widespread, deeply understood now, research driven by activism, I would say, and a lot of interest in, in their suffering has led to groundbreaking work in, in, in various fields, like in the milk industry, for example, in the egg industry, in breeding of um, domestic animals. All this happened in the last 20 years. Before this, as we started our work, it was very little known. It was just innocent kind of uh, uh, helping, protection, rescue, sheltering. And then this whole field started opening up and more and more people came to understand what animal welfare and what animal activism actually means. We started in the beginning, I would say that um, it was inspired by a wonderful, incredible English woman called Crystal Rogers and she actually opened our hearts and our eyes to the sentient being of, of animal consciousness and when we started working we understood the multiple layers of suffering and they are so capable of suffering even from the most delicate fragile chick to the mighty elephant they are capable of as much suffering as humans are. And unfortunately, humans are the agents who kind of govern almost all aspects of all animal lives, especially domestic and to a large extent wild as well. As, as we were going through these things and we found, at least I was so fortunate to land up in Bangalore, where with a wonderful team of co-workers, we founded the organizations that would actually, I think, be path breakers because Cuba, when it first started, and the Wildlife Rescue Center, it all awakened people's uh, hearts and minds that animals needed help. And as we started working and opening shelters and speaking and uh, get, getting into uh, awareness classes, education, rescue, ambulance service, uh, the, the, the entire uh, environment was changing. And uh, I must say, we were met with a lot of support a lot of people came forward to help. There were, there were things that were unfolding before us. And as we started understanding even more and more of, of, the, of the hidden secrets, there happened to come an experience in my life. Active elephants is something that you and I see often around us, not so often as dogs and cats, but often enough. When we were young, we took a lot of pleasure in circuses. We took pleasure in tourist rides. We saw elephants with a lot of uh, with a lot of glamour behind them, 
as we started embarking on our journey of knowing about captive elephants in India, I must say everything wore off. We were shaken to the core. We travelled for at least five years visiting all the elephant, captive elephant situations which are prevalent in our country. And that included the uh, hubs of Rajasthan. It included Assam, where the trafficking happened. It went onwards to Kerala, where there was a lot of brutality. Uh, but they would realize that the elephants that they loved so much, and I think with Indians, there is a huge amount of unconditional love for elephant. But when we realize what they're going through, it's very hard to accept. And it's very hard to change mindsets. So here was an elephant who was in our city and she was living in this car, broken down car garage and there was constant noise all the time and elephants have very, very sensitive hearing and she belonged to a religious institution and she would be taken for begging every day. She'd come back and be tied here, be subject to all this noise and chaos around her and it was, it was a very routine daily affair and nobody thought it was anything wrong. There was nothing, uh, uh, you know, incorrect in the way that such a large animal is being kept in the middle of a crowded city space. Her story is good. Her story was that after kind of we ramped up our complaints and our letters and our appeals, she was finally confiscated and today she resides at the Banarkata Park. As, as this, this is the kind of picture that is very common in in in, in our religious institutions, and in in our part of the world, uh, it is much more common than in North India. Now, these are animals that have been brought at a very young age, probably as a calf, has been captured from the northeast, has been trafficked, like they traffic illegal. Um, uh, uh, drug trafficking, child trafficking, women trafficking, same way elephants are trafficked. And you'll be surprised to know, and as we were, that elephants do not breed in captivity. So each, every elephant that you see has its uh, source in the wild. Somewhere in the wild, it has been captured and by tribals, has been handed over to middlemen, the middlemen then do the brokering with all parts of India and huge sums of money are exchanged for these animals to come to be where they are. And when they come to be where they are in our part of the world, it's a little different in North India, but in our part of the world, they're subjugated to the, the worst housing and keeping conditions. They're usually housed on concrete floors. They are left for begging on the streets because the temples don't want to spend money. So they give the livelihood, um, the core of the livelihood of the mahu depends on the elephant. So he's not given a salary. He's not given any resources. He uses the elephant as his resource to, to earn money for his family and for his upkeep. And for festivals, they are brought into. And for wedding processions, marriages, or for any uh, functions, they are rented out. So the, re the revenue is shared between the Mahu. We cannot blame the Mahu here. He is a victim. He's as much a victim as the elephant is. And the, 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 the people that would be to blame would be actually no one to blame as such because the, the vista is very vast. It, it has all evolved due to tradition, culture, or whatever you may call it. But it has become a perverse means now of earning money and of uh, uh, of exploitation. It's, it's complete commercialism and crass exploitation and that too for a scheduled one wildlife and which is dwindling in numbers. It's not that they are going up, the numbers, uh, their spaces are going down. So they are constantly coming out of their wilderness space because they have nowhere to go. And as they go from one forest to another, it's all crisscrossed with developments, with dams, rivers, railways, call it what you will. And so they are fractured. So today their population is very susceptible to inbreeding or to, or, or to any kind of disturbance. And therefore we can't have this luxury of babies being poached from the wild, brought into the thing, made to die miserable deaths, and then, you know, and then 
say that this is a continuation of our tradition. It's not anymore. It's, it's, it's something very, very morally unethical, what has been happening and what is now uncovered for the first time to people. These are the male elephants of, of Kerala, where they are used extensively for the Puram festivals. Now, all these are young tuskers and they are so badly abused and you can see from their leg wounds and you can see from their backs and their thighs and their, they, they have been beaten and brutalized because they have to withstand the crowds, they have to withstand the noise and they have to withstand firecrackers. And no elephant, males in the wild are ever together because they have their territories and they have their uh, um, uh, uh, distance they maintain from each other because they, are, they, they need to only access, they usually live in small bachelor herds and they access the females only during the mating season. There's, there's always a competition among the males. To have these kind of 30 males packed close to each other, the, their stress levels are so high that they can explode. And most of them are sometimes in mass, which is artificially suppressed. They are beaten, brutally subjugated and put forward for these festivals. And this is a natural wild elephant herd. I think you may know that elephants have a matriarchal society. They are led by the wisest and the most experienced of the female elephants. And they are a very, very affectionate society. The way they look after their children is pro probably their better mothers and families than humans are. They, 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 they always have the, child, the baby always protected. There are multiple mothers, aunts. One mother, multiple aunts, grandmothers and other female herd members who closely monitor the baby. The baby grows up with only play and feeding and, and they are never brutalized. The way they come into, and I mean, the only tragedy of their lives is not even death. The tragedy would be if they are captured. The, they also are natural gardeners. Their dung is very precious in the forest. They, they attract all kinds of uh, insects and lizards. They form small ecosystems. They naturally um, uh, the, uh, replenish the forest with new growth. They clear grasslands. They find paths. They are one of our keystone species. Um, focus in life became that we, at least from my side and from our group, we have to convince the government of Karnataka to do something for the elephants in our country, in, our, in, in at least in our state. In this captive numbers, I am not taking the forest department's numbers. They have captive elephants in their camps, which is Chakrabel, Bandipur, Nagarhode, um, uh, Muthodi. These are elephant camps owned by the government for their own work. We are not including that because government has its own way of working and are doing a good job with their camps. Where we feel intervention is deeply required is with our private ownership. Elephants in private ownership are in such bad condition that once you see it and you recognize the symptoms of, of PTSD, of, of, uh, of, the, of the stress levels, um, of the way that certain elephants have, have become a risk to their own mahouts and to the temple devotees, we have to make the government change its policies and somehow try and see that they are slowly pushed and pressured towards having centers where these elephants can be brought in for rest, rehabilitation and treatment. And it has to be free of cost. As is, government is always short of budget. And therefore, we can't tell them it's because they have their own numbers of elephants very high. They, we, they can't be taking in private ownership elephants all the time because they don't have the budget for it. So we started in collaboration with the State Forest Department of Karnataka. We started an elephant rehabilitation facility where it took us a decade to convince, appeal, fall at the feet of the officers, telling them we have to do it. This is the picture. This is what's happening. This is how you have to uh, manage it. You, you can't let this be neglected. Finally, I think after this all is growing old in the department, I mean, for a decade, they must have seen us you know, haunting their corridors. They said, 
okay, we will start a center, but we will have to have an MOU where you will do entirely the, the, the administration and we will assist you with everything else, which is the infrastructure and the land. And we were so and are so utterly grateful because they did give us the most beautiful land. To eyes, it's very beautiful. It may not be very ideal elephant country, but for old, uh, sometimes sick, sometimes full of abscess, full of injury, we could not risk the presence of wild elephants. Anywhere that we go in Karnataka, there's huge number of wild elephants. And to have female elephants, there would be absolute total you know, conflict, not only with the elephants, but with the villagers. So we chose a place and they were uh, good enough to give it to us. And they, it, it, it is now in under joint management. Thanks. It's under joint management. So I just, so we, so I invite all of you sometimes to come and visit the place so that you see for yourself what can be achieved and whether it is possible to make it even, even more important and bigger and, and make it as a, as a, uh, as a kind of a um, uh, icon for the rest of India, where there are centers, elephant care centers, but very few in number. They cannot and are not able to manage the number that need help. And another thing is, I would appeal to you as my last uh, prayer, that please try and see and move away to elephant symbolism rather than the live elephant. We are so rich in, in uh, symbolism, Hinduism, Buddhism, they, they, these traditions and religions are full of symbols. And that is where we need to capture the imagination of the public so that they don't want elephants live in temples anymore or in circuses anymore or anywhere where they, and in captivity, they are abused. All that we can do is not enough. They have such complex lives that they are best in the wild. Thank you. Thank you so much.